so I'm going to go through, there's not too many, I'll read those. Um, first are from a couple of people who were students here before I was here. I came in 1973, so uh, these go back a little way. Uh, the first is from John D'Onofrio, a name I've heard, but someone I don't know. Um, I, and he says, I still think of the Infinity Seminar as a high point of my years at Syracuse. And another from Claude McMillan, who is now retired from teaching at Onondaga Community College. Uh, he also finished before I was here. Uh, and he said, I find your classes inspiring in their presentations and content. You also recommended that I write an article on Kant's critique of judgment, which I did, and it was subsequently published in Kant's Studien. I am proud to have been one of your students and will remember and cherish that experience for the rest of my life. Claude McMillan. Um, now, from somebody who was a student here uh, shortly after I came was uh, Rod Stewart, who's now teaching in Texas. Uh, not, not the other Rod Stewart, <laughs> which actually came up even way back then when I was making um, But Jose doesn't know about the other Rod Stewart. <laughs> and he said, please give Jose my warmest regards. As I am sure many others will attest, uh, his way of doing philosophy and teaching others is without peer. My life was blessed to be able to have him as a teacher in my grad school days here. And Ali Karatai sent a message from Turkey uh, saying, I wish Professor Benedetti most joyful retirement years. In all the philosophy courses I teach, I remember his insightful and incisive remarks about whatever topic we, we are talking about. I had attended all his courses during my presence at Syracuse, and I learned much from them. With deep gratitude to Professor Benedetti, Ali Karatai. And uh, uh, from uh, Andrew Cortens, uh, we have, <coughs> you were the single biggest influence on my approach to the two aspects of my career that I've taken, that have taken up the most of my time. <laughs> Metaphysics <laughs> and teaching. I will be forever indebted to you. The profession is the better for your contributions. Please accept my congratulations and warmest wishes on your retirement. I am very sorry that I am unable to convey them in person. Uh, we also heard from some uh, former colleagues and other friends. Here's a message from Dean Zimmerman, a little longer. <laughs> One of the many pleasures of the Syracuse department was Jose's inventive and amusing talk. His hilariously apt introductions of speakers, his wickedly funny questions and counterexamples, his highly original philosophical hypotheses. I'll never forget the party at which he proposed to me that Timothy Williamson's argument for the impossibility of uh, vagueness proved that God exists. <laughs> After all, it would take a God to lay down the conventions needed to render our otherwise sloppy linguistic practices so determinate that all our truth evaluable sense sentences come out either true or false. And the argument now 
is that God belongs. By the way, the reason is that I presented this to Zimmerman, by the way, who's a devout Christian, by the way. It's very important, by the way. Who's <laughs> being uh, catering to him. <laughs> so, so it's very important in this argument that part of the argument is that God, and this is by the relevant to Zimmerman, that God is part of our linguistic society, our community. And we have the doctrine, as Hillary Putnam mentioned, of experts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this, is very this is very technical stuff. I mean, this is <laughs> okay, so this is technical stuff. Um, um, uh, uh, what was that? What was it? Right? Vision of linguistic language. What's that? What did I just say? Expert. Oh, Putnam. Putnam. Putnam's doctrine of experts. So it's, and this is why it was appealing to Zimmerman, you see, who was a prey to God and stuff. And all, so not everyone in this audience who believes that God is an linguistic uh, society. But he has to believe this, you see. He could talk to God and God could talk to him. So the point was, God belongs to our linguistic society. We, of course, will accept well, we need the sharp cut-off point. It will be whatever God says. You see. Now, we might even believe God is doing it because of wisdom. But according to the theory, that's not it at all. There isn't any wisdom here. So we're not talking about an omniscient creature. It okay. flips one of his points. Okay, now, okay. I told this story to, to, um, to Williams. And I told him in connection with being very dissatisfied with his own explanation about how it's uh, about use. You know his explanation as to what what determines the sharp cutoff points. And I said, no, I think this is a better story. And this is what he said to me. Oh, that business about use and so on that I said in my book. I just said that for the pu philosophical public. <laughs> this is a very important, by the way, confession by a major. <laughs> you people who've been teaching this kind of thing said, you know, this seems rather weak. He never believed in this. <laughs> this is Popham. And by the way, he was rather attracted to this. <laughs> well, this view about the God story, well, you know, it's a lot better than this one. <laughs> brilliant, better daddy idea. Yes, <laughs> what that I could come up with a couple of those every few years. Jose tosses them out like candy at a parade. <laughs> Shine on, you crazy diamond. <laughs> And then uh, Bill Lichen heard about the celebration, so Bill Lichen sent a note. And, uh, oh, let that... me tell you the story about Bill Lichen. <laughs> 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 I made a mention to him. Bill Lichen, we, uh, we were looking for a uh, He was being interviewed for a job here. And I was very impressed with him. And I went at once to our chairman and said, we've got to grab him. Well, Syracuse, I'm afraid. <laughs> Later on, when I saw like and I told him this story, I said, look, I wanted you to come to Syracuse. I went to our chairman, and they all, they ignored what I said. And he said, but if they'd done what you had done, I would come to Syracuse. <laughs> so there's another thing about a philosopher today. Lycan would have come to Syracuse and went elsewhere because we just didn't have the time to, to bother them. <laughs> What's that? You hired Peter on that occasion. Yes. yes. You hired Peter on that Before that, as a Chicago graduate student, 
I had read his book, Infinity, with great interest and edification. As I write this, I glance to my left. My 1964 copy is sitting about nine feet from me. He says, but I heard of Jose even well before that. I wonder how many people remember that he was immortalized by and helped to immortalize Severn Darden, an original founder of the Chicago Improv Troops, Compass Players, and Second City, in Darden's well-known metaphysics lecture of the late 1950s. Darden speciously quoted him on, appropriately, Heraclitus. I, sh I doubt that any other living philosopher has had any such distinction. <laughs> I must say, by the way, let me, I'm very proud of the fact that I was the best man to ever tell sweating. <laughs> um, Rachel Briggs was an undergraduate uh, uh, here and now is in Australia at Sydney, Sydney right? Yeah. Um, said, un unfortunately, I'm far away in Australia and cannot attend. But I would like to send two metaphysical poems for Jose's retirement <laughs> and close below. It is hard to imagine the department without him. I think poetry is the best way to show my appreciation. So here's, I'm going to read her two poems. The Concept Horse. The Concept Horse unrolls his hooves to stand, stake still, and trot. To gobble down your sugar loaves and keep his fast, which only proves the Concept Horse is not. <laughs> and yet he is. <laughs> Here's what you dream of when you dream a horse. He's what you dream of when you dream a horse, part pinto. What they show you some of when you ask what cowboys strum of, grazed on grain and gorse. You ride him up the pebbled road where sunstroke warps the ledge above the class of cactus spines, the tattered lace of spindly pines to touch the iron edge. The forest where all oaks are one where bluets fade to blue, where Fraser fir and pin pine join to sprout a single spiral cone, and every seed is true. He'll ease his bell-shaped shoes along the moss. No concept bud may mar your boots. Come, whistle, sing, and crush against your swollen tongue the berry of the good. <laughs> and then the second one is the... Uh, the tortoise ditty, with more obvious relationship to Jose's work. Just as a but here we go. <clears throat> the tortoise ladled up silver meat with a half a sprig of parsley, half to save and half to eat, and will never reach the end. <laughs> Achilles raced me on a dare with a half a mile of gravel. Never got more than halfway there, and he'll never reach the end. Achilles ran another race with a shoe half full of blisters, and every mile he doubled his pace, and I don't know where he'll end. I sliced the sausage very thin with a half a half a sausage. I opened up its gutsy skin, but I couldn't find the end. I'd like to hunt the kangaroo with a quiver full of arrows, but my feather ain't got no follow-through, so what good's the pointy end? <laughs> a firefly flickered much too fast for a half a quarter second. With every phosphorescent glass, he asked, how will it end? I set a bomb to explode the moon and a half the planet with it. If the others didn't go off too soon, but the moon met a grisly end. I promise I'll repeat this song with a half a mind to do it. But honestly, it takes me much too long, so I guess it's time to end. <laughs> <laughs> and I have two more tributes that I think are uh, very good that I want to read. Um, Bradley Beach, who was a student here sometime. That's hard for me to remember, too. Uh, without, it says, without question, Jose was one of the most influential people in shaping my own thought and setting the course of my career. It is with great fondness that I remember our many conversations, discussions, and arguments. His great intellectual curiosity and tremendous enthusiasm for philosophy, as well as for the game of chess, 
were inspirational and became character traits I worked to emulate. More significantly, Jose helped to set the course of my own philosophical beliefs. I'm indebted to his brilliance and his dialectical acumen, which helped me formulate many of my own essential philosophical commitments. There is rarely a day that I don't reflect upon some puzzle, problem, or paradox introduced to me by Jose Benedetti. My best wishes to him as he brings his illustrious teaching career at Syracuse University to a close. That's Bradley Beach. And then the final one is a uh, message from Carol Oberbrunner, who, of course, lives in Syracuse, but uh, still had to go give an exam and such things because she's teaching at Hobart and William Smith uh, and couldn't make it here. She was very disappointed. But here is the, uh, here's the message. Jose Benedetti. What a gift he's been to us. What a jewel in our Syracuse University department. A central figure in the department from the time that he arrived, far-seeing, honest, clear, gloriously eccentric, humble, <coughs> unfailingly hitting the target with apparently simple insight, he has provided philosophical vitality and personal integrity throughout that time. If I were not giving two final exams at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva today, I would certainly be there. Um, I yearn to be a part of this important ceremony. A steady object of mine's unspoken affection, and I'm sure the affection of a multitude of students and colleagues, Jose Benedetti's presence has lit up the department in untold ways. At philosophical talks, when he asked a question, exciting surprises, tren trenchant observations, and thought-provoking new perspectives always emerged. Philosophically incredibly sharp, personally warm, and consistently wise, he has made an enormous difference to the lives he's touched. Powered by his example, we are more free to be ourselves, to think even, ever more deeply, to persist beyond what we had thought were our limits. The breadth and depth of his knowledge and scholarship have always been awe-inspiring to me. How can one human being have such an all-encompassing philosophical mind? Philosophy as a profession has been ennobled by his presence in it, and I'm profoundly thankful to know him, to have been encouraged by him, to have, uh, to have absorbed as much as I could of his intellectual vigor and his endless fascination with the issues that engaged him. Being with him, and indeed even thinking about him as I write this message, always brings me great joy. Uh, he has my undying gratitude. Carol Overton. prefigured by that fact that he applied for a position in aesthetics, 
namely an appreciation for the dramatic. And uh, that appreciation for the dramatic has uh, pervaded his career all through time. It shows up in various ways, some of them we've seen today uh, with uh, the dramatic uh, emphasis on Timothy Williamson's uh, uh, positions and on Grand Priest's positions and the way in which they have a dramatic impact in philosophy and a, a dramatic force when we first confront them. And Jose lives for such things, I think. There are other forms of drama, and some of those show up if you ever have the experience of driving in a car with Jose. <laughs> <laughs> because another of his features is that he is absolutely devoted to the life of the mind and the philosophy. And there's very little room left for attention to the road. <laughs> and as a consequence, if you're in the car with Jose, Jose will be looking at you, not the street. And a significant portion of the time. <laughs> Jose, Jose, for the sake of dramatic emphasis, it's true. Uh, uh, now, for the sake what, of dramatic emphasis, that's really terrible. <laughs> somebody, uh, often me, often it's been Eric, as we heard earlier, on others on other occasions, with whom he has something important to discuss. And we all benefit from it. And it keeps us alive. And the energy there is incredible. It really is uh, an admirable and actually an almost uh, unfathomable <laughs> energy that, uh, of the mind that's there and it infuses us all. And I must say, uh, you know, when I uh, first became a graduate student or an undergraduate, this was a, a, a decent department. It was uh, okay. Um, but when Jose and uh, Pontiac Butchroff and Larry Hardin joined this group, then it really took off. It was at that point that this department really became a department that was worthy of offering a graduate program. And I was lucky to be one of the first people to benefit from that. And I will be forever grateful. Thank you, Jose.
school, and I survived that, so that was very fortunate. Um, it was it opened my eyes to all kinds of things. I had a fairly patchy undergraduate philosophical education at a fairly little-known school, um, and uh, I had read Naming and Necessity. I said, well, I read Naming and Necessity um, as an undergraduate. My grasp of naming necessity was so poor that the only thing I could think of to write in my weekly tutorial for David Pears was how does Kripke call himself a philosopher of language when he says it never occurred to him that Dartmouth means town at the mouth of the river Dart? Because I was brought up in England and everybody knows that. So that, that gives you an idea of the depth of my understanding. I took Jose's metaphysics class legendary metaphysics class. At the beginning of the semester, Jose tells us that the required text is naming a necessity, but we're not allowed to read it. <laughs> he also tells us that we're not allowed to spend more than a day or two writing our final paper. It's going to be a very easy class, he tells us. Um, and in fact, in the course of that semester, which meant the class met three times a week, once we discussed a passage from Naming the Necessity. It was the famous passage about whether there could be unfelt pains. But this class, more than any other, had a huge influence on me because at the end of that class, I understood Naming the Necessity. This was a, it was an act of magic. I call it learning by osmosis. It was such a brilliant pedagogical display. We discussed everything, including, of course, Thaley's Falling in the Well, which came up earlier this afternoon. But at the end of that course, I understood naming, I mean, I, I think I, don't quiz me. <laughs> I think I understood naming the necessity. I was just stunned, and I, I ever since then, I, I have aspired to teach a tenth as well as that. That was uh, an absolutely amazing, an amazing experience. Um, I also took his class on philosophy of math. Now this was in the days when graduate students here had to work to get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> we had to take 20 courses. We had to take three written exams. We had to take an oral exam on, on a, a well-known historical figure. There was a fourth exam which we could get out of if we took three different courses and achieved at least a B plus philosophy of math, uh, philosophy of science, and logic. Uh, and so philosophy of math was a course that everybody took. And that was the course in which I wanted, at one point, I wanted to dive under a desk and hide myself, because in a rash moment, in a question to Jose, I confused sets with mereological sums. <laughs> and you can just imagine, as soon as the word out of my mouth, you could imagine, oh no, what's going to happen now? You just have to grin and bear it and take it like a adult. <laughs> um, but everybody, everybody needs to say something stupid at least once in a class with Jose. Uh, it's, it's a rite of passage. Um, <laughs> That was also a wonderful class. In fact, um, the Benedetti family, Jose and of course Catherine Lord, represented for me seven out of the 20 courses that I took here. I took four with Jose and three with Catherine. Um, and they were a huge influence on me. Um, the two JBs in the department were the two biggest influences on me. Jonathan Bennett, who directed my dissertation, and Jose Benedetti, uh, I have, uh, I think I've been immensely enriched. Um, but I, I, I do want to just <coughs> mention one more thing, same as how Mark mentioned the experience of driving with Jose, and I had that experience on a couple of times with John as well. I must, I must say that on one occasion, the conversation on metaphysics uh, occurred with me in the front seat and John in the back seat. And naturally, every time John was stupid enough to say something, <laughs> I had to cut him off. 
John had very little concern for his life, I think. <laughs> um, we, got, we got there safely in the end. But for, for a man who values uh, reason so highly, it's, I must also point out that Jose is also a bit of an empiricist at heart. He loves to test hypotheses, and my, my favorite recollection of this occurring also involved a car, <coughs> and it involved a ride with Jose to a restaurant. Um, after a speaker had given a talk, John and I were in a car, and Jose was trying to decide where to park. And I told him where to park, because it said on the road where to park, but it, it was, you know, this is Syracuse, you can park on the side of the road from 6 p.m. on days to 6 p.m. even days. On the side of the road. <laughs> so I pointed out which side of the road Jose should park on. Jose noticed that there were cars parked on both sides of the road. I tried to explain that that's because it was 6.30, and they leave a certain amount of time to move across. So Jose said, well, I want to park on this side. So I said, but you know you'll get a parking ticket. Jose's response, let's test this hypothesis. <laughs> Most dramatic, of course, is, is uh, Eric Schleser's reconstruction of my scholarly life, <laughs> which I will have to be thinking about for a long time. My first reaction is just a first reaction is, who is this person? <laughs> Quotations are there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you know. I mean, they're there. The, the, the dates are given. The journals are given. You might think, well, that nails it. No. <laughs> that, that, that's not, that's, that doesn't do it. I mean, I mean, it's evidence, but, uh, <laughs> but as he mentions, he's going to provide a unity to my academic scum. And uh, I mean, it's not as if there's an alternative unity. <laughs> I mean, 
that I'm vouching for. <laughs> now, uh, I know more about me, and there is this little uni uni uh, uh, unity. And it's not that. Uh, uh, I haven't thought of my academic life at all as having a unity. I mean, so that, I mean, you know, that you know, doesn't uh, publish something one time, you publish something else. It's all being put together. Very <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, being held to what I said earlier. You know. So this is almost this confection. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, it, you know I, as as myself in this uh, uh, the, this this game, after all, of hermeneutics of scholarship. Uh, I certainly. Uh, acknowledge that we're engaged in rational reconstruction, uh, always practicing uh, uh, what Donald Davidson calls charity, <laughs> technical <coughs> device, try to make our authors come out as looking good. <laughs> and certainly uh, in that respect, uh, uh, Eric has gone to, to uh, very great lengths. But uh, 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 even though this is the most dramatic, because most extended uh, version, uh, many of these things being said, uh, I mean, most conspicuously, of course, my driving. <laughs> I mean, I have no awareness. And, and, and I'm appalled. <laughs> and I can only think how lucky I've been that what you would expect to occur <laughs> never seemed to have occurred. <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing I've learned about my life. There was this remarkable luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one time, another time, another time. I could have the blood of, of a colleague. <laughs> one colleague. Well, 